Thank you very much, uh, Sanjeev. And I hope my <laughs> I was speaking perfectly fine until about five minutes ago. I, I don't know what happened. <laughs> um, but it's, it's the, uh, uh, maybe it's the ocean because it is, it is indeed uh, a great honor to be um, uh, presenting this lecture um, in, honor, <coughs> in honor of uh, James Mead. Uh, I can say with, without uh, uh, any exaggeration that, that uh, everything I know about open economy macroeconomics uh, to apply a term somewhat anachronistic to his work, um, I've learned from his uh, one of his two volumes of international economic policy, um, and I, I, would, I would say that uh, the Eurozone today would benefit a whole lot <laughs> to turn back and look at uh, his discussion of internal balance, external balance, and policy assignment problem, and so on. Um, uh, I've also learned a lot um, about how to be an economist uh, from, from James Mead. I think uh, Mead's later work on uh, institutional design, on redesigning the institutions of capitalism, in particular um, labor market institutions uh, and uh, ownership institutions, uh, in a way that would deliver better social objectives. Effectively, uh, <clears throat> uh, disentangle two aspects of the market economy, which uh, combines the efficiency aspects of the price mechanism with its uh, role in distributive income, uh, which uh, essentially disentangling those things, having uh, an efficient market economy, but that doesn't automatically deliver distributional outcomes uh, that might be uh, suboptimal. How to do that uh, by um, thinking in terms of uh, different pay mechanisms or uh, labor capital partnerships um, uh, and use of basic income and many other things that we talked about. Uh, uh, I, I think um, it is, is the kind of imaginative uh, um, institutional economics that, that unfortunately I don't think our profession uh, does a lot of these days, and I think it's, it's too hard to our to our loss. Um, but uh, the connection uh, that uh, I want to draw between his work and what I'm going to be uh, presenting uh, today uh, it has to do with um, uh, some of his work, which is probably uh, among the least well-known. It's probably something that that, that uh, deserves only about a line, uh, in fact, in, in some of the longest uh, intellectual biographies of his that, that I've seen. Um, and that's the work that he did in Mauritius, um, an island uh, in um, the Indian Ocean off the coast of Africa. Uh, and this was back in 1960. Um, and uh, he was in charge of a small group of experts uh, that went to the island economy um, to, to try to figure out uh, what the economies, uh, what the <coughs> island's economic prospects were and what, if anything, the government ought to be doing. This was in preparation for um, uh, Mauritius becoming an independent country, um, and there was a little concern about whether Mauritius could um, uh, handle independence. Uh, it was a country that uh, was... Uh, uh, torn apart uh, by a variety of ethnic uh, tensions. Uh, it was a monocrop economy, essentially uh, sugar uh, uh, was the, literally the only source of export earning, the real, the main industry uh, of the economy. Um, and uh, with very little, uh, uh, by the way, of, of manufacturing and services. And, uh, and Mead also discovered uh, what looked like uh, a terrifying uh, population explosion uh, um, waiting to undermine any prospect of economic uh, development of the economy. And he, he described at great length uh, this terrifying prospect of very rapid population growth closed. Um, and um, uh, he, he worked hard to try to think about uh, what could be done. Um, and and uh, among his recommendations, um, uh, one which um, uh, particularly connects with what I'm going to be talking about uh, is the one that had to do with industrial development. Uh, he said, there's no way that the sugar industry or services can actually absorb um, the uh, surplus labor uh, that this island has and will have in the future. The only possibility is really to absorb uh, this labor. Uh, in new manufacturing enterprises. Um, and at the time, this was in 1960, there weren't that many uh, examples he could turn to, but he, he mentioned explicitly Hong Kong um, and uh, as, as one possibility, although he said, of course, Hong Kong had so many more advantages 
uh, being in the Chinese hinterland uh, than, uh, than, uh, than, than with Mauritius. But he said that's really basically the only option. Uh, the only option is to develop these manufacturing uh, enterprises, uh, partly through uh, sort of for the home market, but also increasingly for, for exports. He also said that this wasn't going to happen through the magic of the market, uh, that the government would have to actively intervene uh, to promote these industrial enterprises. So he described at length a whole series of what we would now call industrial policies uh, to make industrialization happen uh, in, in Mauritius. Among them was the creation of an industrial development board, uh, which would actively uh, look for uh, foreign investors and, and potential investors and provide them with all kinds of advantages. Um, terribly detailed agenda uh, for the future development of, of Mauritius. This was back in 1960. Um, what happened? Um, what happened is that actually uh, Mauritius developed uh, into one of these manufacturing miracles uh, in the next uh, two decades, particularly after 1970, uh, when the country set up uh, a special export zone um, that um, uh, uh, encouraged uh, um, uh, Hong Kong producers from Hong Kong and elsewhere to set up and produce for the European market. Uh, and largely thanks to uh, this industrial uh, employment and industrial growth, the kind of terrifying prospect of this population explosion that we talked about uh, didn't come to pass. In fact, instead, uh, Mauritius became one of the growth miracles, uh, in fact, one of the very few countries um, outside East Asia and the immediate periphery uh, of uh, Western Europe, in the, immediate, in the aftermath of Second World War, where uh, we have experienced these growth miracles. So this is a, a short list of these uh, growth miracles. Um, I think what I have here, I think the, the criteria I've used here to define the growth miracle is a country that grows on a sustained basis at a rate of 4.5 percentage points or higher on an annual basis, 4.5 percentage points or higher, for a period of at least three decades. Okay? And, and this is a list of countries. It's not all, but it's a list of countries that, that satisfy that, that criteria. Um, you can see the period and the growth rate. There's essentially, you know, most of the, the, the East Asian miracle countries that uh, that you know. But there's a couple in the periphery of Europe uh, in the immediate aftermath of the Second World War. And then there is uh, Mauritius um, with a growth rate of 4.6%. Um, just to put this into context, uh, low-income countries have sustained growth rates well below 1% uh, over the period uh, since the uh, mid-1960s. Uh, these growth miracles, the, you know, so probably the one, the, 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 the one that we are most familiar with because it's the largest country, um, uh, China, um, has of course had had significant impact uh, on the geography. Of, uh, of, of production in the world economy, um, and China's economic development since 1978 at this rapid clip um, has had a huge impact on the global distribution of income. Uh, essentially, has had um, China China's growth uh, alone has been the single most important driver of reducing global inequality um, uh, in, 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 in this period. So. Um, what I want to talk about are, is, is basically um, three things. Um, one is I want to look at these growth miracles a little bit more closely to understand uh, what the basic mechanisms was, so that we can understand something about how replicable they are in other contexts. Um, I'm going to focus on one aspect of these growth miracles, which seem to be crucial, which is that they were, as in the Mauritian case, uh, they were. Um, driven by manufacturing industries. They were industrialization based. They were, these are all growth miracles, with the exception of a few small, very resource rich countries. They're all based on uh, rapid industrialization. That raises the question of what is special about manufacturing. Because uh, in the first part, really the first, the, the analytical question to be answered is why does manufacturing matter to rapid growth? and what's so special about manufacturing relative to other activities for low to middle income countries. The second uh, feature, uh, the second topic, is I want to say about something about, um, <coughs> express a certain skepticism about the replicability uh, of this model as we go forward. 
Um, and here I'll talk about some of my recent work on prematurity industrialization. When the term prematurity industrialization was first coined, actually it was for Britain. Uh, people thought that Britain was deindustrializing too soon back in the 1970s. But of course, Britain was already uh, you know, a relatively wealthy country in the 1970s. Today's premature deindustrialization actually is happening in middle and low income countries, in countries that are much, much lower uh, than at lower income levels than, than Britain uh, than Britain reached. And therefore, it's, it's sort of more worrisome because if manufacturing is key uh, to uh, rapid growth, uh, and it's now becoming more difficult for countries to experience uh, industrialization. That, that puts their growth prospects into question. I want to talk a little bit about this um, and, and talk about some of the reasons behind that. And then, uh, in the time that remains, and I may have to go through this rather quickly, I want to confront a paradox, which is that just as I'm going to express to you a skepticism about the uh, miracle economies. It's also the case that in the last 20 years, we've actually increased, we've experienced a very significant ramp up in the growth rate of a whole range of other countries, uh, from India to countries in, in sub Saharan Africa, none of which actually was based on industrialization. So the question is uh, we discovered another mechanism of rapid growth, or is there something that suggests that this was a temporary phenomenon? And that these countries are going to get into trouble, uh, or at least uh, will be have difficulty sustaining the, their growth performance. And I will suggest that the answer is much, much, much more the latter. Okay, so uh, I, I hope not to depress you too much. Um, I think the good news is I think that convergence is going to continue. It is that developing countries will still catch up with the rich countries, but at least that's at least partly due to the fact that I think advanced countries will be going less rapidly. Um, so, uh, growth miracles. How will we explain growth miracles? Um, our standard uh, theory, uh, standard growth theory, has, has trouble uh, explaining growth miracles. Um, if you use this, the, the basic convergence uh, um, um, argument uh, that you know, it's natural that countries that start very poor should be converging to the frontier, so there's, you know, there's, there's a natural, to, after all, you can access technology, you can access markets, you have access to finance, and therefore, you know, why, why, why should there be a puzzle at all that countries that start very uh, you know, far from the frontier should be growing very rapidly? Well, you know, the, the obvious, the, um, the obvious um, uh, uh, <coughs> counter-argument to that is that there is, as, as, we, as, as we now well know, there is... Uh, no evidence of convergence uh, across countries uh, over long periods of time. So this is uh, not good to go through this evidence because it's relatively well known. So if convergence uh, were a fact uh, or were an aspect of the uh, of the real world, then what we would find is that countries that start out poor tend to experience much higher growth rates. Uh, so if you have an, in these charts, you have the initial level of income at the on the horizontal axis. And subsequent growth rate on the vertical axis, if convergence held, uh, there would be a definite uh, negative slope in this relationship in these scatter plots. Uh, the lower the initial income, the faster the subsequent growth rate of an economy. Uh, there is no such evidence in the data as well. But basic convergence is not there. Uh, so a kind of, of uh, convergence, basic convergence equation, which is on the top the right corner there, uh, simply doesn't. Uh, C to hold, or to put it differently, that gamma coefficient is, is roughly zero uh, in, in, in the data. Um, well, uh, um, economists have come up with sort of a, another story, which is to qualify the unconditional um, convergence story with a conditional convergence story, which is to say that, well, maybe what matters is not simply whether you're, you're poor, but whether you're poor, but also doing sort of the right kinds of things. So conditional on following the right kinds of policies, uh, on having the right kind of fundamentals, then you should be growing more rapidly. And um, I think that is true, and I think uh, there is uh, conditional convergence uh, in, in the data in the sense that if you control for things like human capital policies, quality of the institutions, and a bunch of other things, you generally tend to find that controlling for these policies, in fact, countries that are poor tend to do better. So there is conditional convergence. <coughs> 
Uh, but that doesn't help us, uh, that, that gives us a little bit of explanation for why holding these fundamentals constant, uh, poorer countries should be growing more rapidly. It doesn't tell us, uh, no, it doesn't help explain these very rapid growth experiences, what I call the growth miracle cases. Um, so in the, in the, fair, in the, in the basic <coughs> conditional convergence framework, uh, every country converges to its own long run or steady state level of income, this uh, Y star, uh, but every country's long run steady state level of income is a function of its own fundamentals. This theta, uh, theta J, is, is a whole vector of things like investments in human capital, equality of policies, and so forth. Uh, so in, in European parliaments, these are all structural reforms that are supposed to make your economy or at least increase the long run level of your economy's level of productivity. And therefore, if you do these things right, uh, your long run um, um, uh, uh, level of income should go up, and then you converge uh, to, uh, to, uh, to that level. And the, the bigger the gap between your long run level of income and your current level, uh, the faster you grow. Uh, the problem with applying this to growth miracles is that when you do this and try to estimate what the convergence parameter is, uh, it tends to get you a convergence parameter that's relatively low, uh, that is not going to produce the kind of growth miracles. So it's just a very simple um, uh, calibration exercise uh, would be to sort of say, imagine a country that undertakes a very strong reform program, very strong program of structural reforms, uh, in this case, a strong reform that in each year potential income rises to eliminate one third of the gap with rich country income. So this would be really very powerful reforms. And then apply the standard convergence coefficient, which is 2%, uh, then how much growth would we get? Well, you look at sort of the kind of growth that you're going to get in per capita terms, it's the red line, it's, you get a growth rate of about 2.5%, uh, nothing like uh, 4 and a half or higher that we get in the, in, the, in the growth miracle countries, and that's assuming an incredibly strong package of structural reforms. So this framework isn't going to help us explain uh, 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 growth miracles. Well, what you can say is, well, maybe what's happening is that, that you know, there, there are, in fact, these countries that have had uh, very uh, you know, sort of rapid growth, they are the ones that have had exceptionally good policies, institutions, or luck. Um, already from the story about Mauritius, we know that that's unlikely to be the case because Mauritius starts out under such inauspicious circumstances that it would be the last country to expect to, expect to actually experience a growth miracle. Uh, in fact, uh, you look at these individual countries, you find a hodgepodge of, of, of policies such that if in fact these countries had not grown rapidly, you would might as well turn back and say that's the reason the policies are the reason they didn't do that. Uh, so there is, even in China, for example, there is enough uh, uh, heterodoxy and also unorthodoxy um, that, that, um, that if China had not been the miracle country it is, that we might have actually explained it by the features of its present setup, the level of corruption, uh, the fact that much of the economy is still state-owned, the prevalence of the state of enterprises, um, uh, it's, 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 it's unheterodox policies in a large number of the domains. It's not just true about China, it's about true about <coughs> most of the miracle countries uh, which um, you know have departed in significant ways from the Washington consensus idea of what a good policy is. Uh, so it's also therefore it's, it's hard to explain uh, these uh, these um, experiences on the basis of, of exceptionally good policies on the part of, of from, from in terms of the standard uh, diet. Okay, so all of this is to say that there is not an easy. Uh, answer in the literature that's going to explain uh, these these growth miracles. But let's turn to some of the um, some of the basic facts about these countries. And, and one you know, one of the basic facts about these countries is what I've already mentioned before: is that these are all all instances of very rapid industrialization. So here is Italy and Spain, uh, which experience early growth miracles and their experience with rapid industrialization. Uh, in the years after the Second World War. Uh, then in the second panel, I have three uh, Asian countries plus Mauritius, uh, which are almost like in sequence, have um, experienced very rapid um, uh, boosts in, in um, manufacturing. And then you can see that in many of those countries, uh, the industrialization begins to set in at some point. So it's a U, U kind of a relationship. 
And I'll come back later uh, to this U-shaped nature of industrial employment as a share of total employment uh, uh, when I talk about the industrialization or premature deindustrialization later on. Um, so um, growth miracle countries are in fact uh, tend to be different uh, in terms of their industrialization experience uh, relative to other countries. They tend to industrialize much more rapidly. Um, and this is this one for uh, for output shares. This is for um, uh, for employment shares. This is just to show that these countries uh, tend to have uh, sort of very different characteristics in terms of employment. They tend to industrialize more rapidly, and they tend to reach much higher levels of of industrialization at identical levels of income. Okay, uh, so that's just the correlation. The question is: is why should uh, manufacturing matter? Why is it that why is that manufacturing industrialization, as opposed to agriculture, as opposed to many service activities, really provide that escalator? Uh, I'm going to argue that there are three things that are spe specific or special to manufacturing that has made manufacturing an escalator, a very rapid escalator to high incomes, uh, and that other activities do not share. And increasingly, manufacturing itself doesn't. Okay. Those three are one uh, is, is sort of, sort of um, I'll call it, you know, I've talked about convergence, um, is that manufacturing, especially sort of organized formal manufacturing, tends to exhibit something that I've, I've already told you the economy as a whole doesn't. I've sure told you that manufacturing, the economies as a whole, as a whole do not have, do not exhibit unconditional convergence. But if you look at the modern manufacturing sectors of countries, they do. There is unconditional convergence. Uh, that is, so I think that is. So here is. Um, so here's some pictures uh, just to show that these are the equivalents of the uh, scatter plots I had shown you before. Uh, before they were at the level of countries. That is, I had the initial level of productivity on the horizontal axis, and then the subsequent growth rate on the vertical axis. This is the same, except that now I have individual manufacturing industries in individual countries. And what you can see is whether you look at manufacturing as a whole, or you look at individual subsectors within manufacturing, two-digit, three-digit, four-digit uh, manufacturing subsectors. In fact, you have now this, sub, this downward sloping slope uh, in these sectors. There is unconditional convergence in manufacturing. What is the basic story there? What does that mean? I think what it means is that there is something special in the productivity dynamics of manufacturing that it says something like it's relatively easy to copy a manufacturing plant. It's really easy to adopt a blueprint uh, in manufacturing, uh, either directly or through foreign investment. Uh, that it is, it is uh, that, that at least that is what the data is saying. <coughs> so why does this matter? Well, it means now that you have at least part of the economy that is on this automatic uh, Automatic conveyor belt uh, that is part of the economy has uh, this, um, this this escalator property. Now the problem in many low-income countries is that to start up, that's a very small part of their economy. So unconditional convergence within manufacturing isn't going to deliver for you a very high rate of growth, given how small it is typically, three percent, four percent, five percent of the economy to start out with. That's why I think the second thing matters is that. Typically, manufacturing has had significant employment absorption capacity, because, because typically manufacturing has relied on production workers that don't necessarily need to have a whole lot of skills. So you can start in an economy that is, has a very low skill endowment, but you can actually pull people out from informal activities or traditional agriculture into manufacturing uh, without necessarily having to invest into all the education and training and institutions that you need in order to build up the skills of the system. So as as you know, as it was explained to me by a Chinese entrepreneur um, that when they started out uh, building shoe factories in China, uh, basically the only test they applied to their <laughs> prospective workers was whether they could do this or not. <laughs> yeah. Basic eye-hand coordination is the only requirement they had. Uh, that's the only thing you need. Um, and, uh, and with that, what, another way of saying this is that basically, once you get manufacturing started, there's a very close correspondence between factory endowments for, in the country as a low-income country. 
and the factory intensities of manufacturing. So it can grow very rapidly, it can absorb a lot of labor very quickly. The third thing, of course, is tradability. On the, uh, it's okay on the supply side to have all this supply of labor that's available for absorption, but if there wasn't a an outlet, uh, you would soon be running into uh, diminishing profitability as you produce more and more, and if productivity in the rest of the economy is increasing, then the manufacturing industry is confined to a domestic country would and be experiencing a lot of price and, and profitability reductions, and therefore the process would be self-extinguished. But if you're a tradable industry, you can export, then this is scalable activity. You can very quickly increase. What that means is that if you start small, you do a few things. Just to mean that your manufacturing industries, it's very easy to set up a process that's going to very quickly grow up your manufacturing. Uh, even though the rest of the economy becomes, still remains institutionally and human capital and fundamental wise very poor. Uh, but you can still get very rapid, rapid growth. Um, so, because what that means in terms of, of uh, thinking about these special features of manufacturing and special kind of dualism uh, that manufacturing entails for the economy as a whole is that we need to think in traditional growth theory with at least sort of about two kinds of sectors. Uh, the traditional sector, uh, which has convergence properties uh, along the lines of conventional convergence, and a modern sector, which I've been calling manufacturing, uh, which has convergence properties along the lines of an unconditional convergence model, and that intersectoral reallocation between the relatively less productive traditional sector and the relatively more productive modern sector. Um, so what that means is that the kind of convergence equation you would get uh, from that minimal two-sector <coughs> version of that would be that the growth equation would have now these three terms, uh, A, B, and C. A is simply the conditional convergence part of the, which we had before. But now we have two additional terms. This part B is the, uncon is the unconditional convergence that comes from modern parts of the economy, manufacturing. And part C is the reallocation of labor from uh, from, from the traditional sector, where relative productivity pi t is low, to the modern sector, where relative productivity pi m is high. And every unit reallocation of labor from the modern to the traditional gets multiplied, gets this premium of increased productivity in the uh, more rapidly converging uh, modern sector. Now, the quantitative importance of this is that with this, actually, you can come close to the growth miracles. You can explain extremely high growth rates. And what's going to happen is that early on, especially, item C is going to play a huge role. Because B is very small early on. Because you start from a very small manufacturing sector. That's captured here by the share of employment in manufacturing, alpha M. If that's very small, no matter how rapid convergence in manufacturing is, it doesn't add up to growth at the economy-wide level. Uh, but you can get a big effect out of C, which is that for every unit of labor you're moving, you can get a multiple of three or four in terms of productivity gains. And that's, in fact, uh, what simple calibration uh, um, results in, which is that if we add in all of these things together, we can get easily sort of growth rates that are going to be much higher than 7% than early on, or certainly higher than 5-6% uh, later on in the growth process. That's simply coming from just uh, taking into account these, these two features, that there is a part of the economy which is you know, acting as this conveyor belt, uh, um, and that there is rapid uh, intersectoral reallocation. So that's, in a way, all that I've done is said something that you know, put some mechanisms and some explanation be, be behind a story that we've already, you know, development economists, at least of the old tradition, have always, always known that sort of manufacturing and industrialization are important. Uh, but it's never been clear, and to much of the neoclassical economics profession, it sort of has not been clear as to sort of manufacturing should matter at all. Um, and I think it sort of matters because of, 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 of these kinds of features uh, that, that, I, that, I, that I've highlighted. Okay, now, I'm actually not going to talk about uh, the kind of policies uh, that have enabled rapid industrialization. Uh, this is sort of my, my one slide summary of what I think are uh, the things that, that played a role. Uh, 
look macro fundamentals and development strategy global context. And also, I think, very importantly, the pragmatic, opportunistic, unorthodox government policies to stimulate domestic manufacturing industries. These have differed from country to country, but every country that has had a manufacturing miracle has had them, including Mauritius, of course. Mauritius, you know, Mead himself had suggested some highly unorthodox policies, such as, uh, you know, sort of protection of the home market, uh, various credit and other employment subsidies to, to support manufacturing. <coughs> In practice, what the Mauritian government did was to, start to segment the export-oriented part of the economy from the domestically protected part of the economy <coughs> by having a special ex export zone uh, where only export-oriented activities uh, would, be, would be placed. Okay. I don't want to talk about, you know, the, 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 if there's questions, I'm happy to talk about the, the policy background, but uh, I want to go back uh, sort of, uh, to my theme of, of sort of what happens next. So. Suppose that we understand what, where these growth variables are coming from, and then we actually understand their fundamental driving force, which is this process of industrialization. We understand what's special about manufacturing. So we're not, we're not fetishizing manufacturing industries per se. Uh, we understand why they're important because of their characteristics of unconditional convergence, tradability, and ability to rapidly absorb most of labor. So now things have changed. These things aren't operating with exactly the same force as before. As I mentioned, we actually have a process, a worldwide process of uh, deindustrialization. And given that it's happening even in the low income countries, I think it's quite appropriate to call it a premature deindustrialization process. And I think there is uh, the, 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 the uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on the reasons behind this, but it's important to really underline why I think this is happening. This is happening for a combination of three reasons. One is that the world now is much more globalized. What that means is that a smaller number of countries can actually specialize in manufacturers. A smaller number of countries actually become, can become the super industrializers, while a lot of other countries can actually end, do end up uh, becoming uh, uncompetitive uh, or have competitive disadvantage in manufacturing. Um, so what globalization means is that a lot of countries previously had natural protection in which some of their domestic manufacturing industries could have turned from babies to well, infants to uh, eventually at least some of them to mature industries. In a world of openness and relatively small transport and communication costs, you have in a country like Ethiopia today, the simplest of manufacturers being imported from China or the Southeast Asian countries. And it's impossible to start these industries simply because of the forces of global competition. Um, the second thing is, is shifts in global demand. There's a global shift in demand away from manufacturers. Uh, so everything else being the same, same the, the market size is shifting. The market size is getting smaller. So more the same kind of competition as to going to a smaller market size. And third, possibly, you know, one of the most important things here is that the technology of manufacturing uh, is being, becoming increasingly skill intensive and capital intensive. So remember, one of the big you know, uh, advantages of manufacturing was that it could absorb all these workers that actually couldn't read or write, but they could do this. Okay. Now they need to be able to actually sort of you know read manual and run uh, robots and, and all kinds of digital equipment. So in a world where you can print, you can have you can manufacture shoes with 3D printing very cheaply, <laughs> even compared to uh, using low-cost labor in Africa. Why would you actually build a shoe factory in Ethiopia if you can actually do it with robots or 3D printing in Germany? Putting it differently, comparative advantage in manufacturing is now moving away from uh, low-cost countries or, 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 or labor abundant countries. Okay. So just, let me just show you a few pictures of that. So this is kind of a, you know, the standard uh, U-shaped uh, um, uh, relationship between manufacturing employment and output shares. So the blue curve is the employment share. Um, the, uh, the red one is the share of manufacturing in nominal, uh, nominal prices. And the green one is the share of manufacturing in, at constant real price, constant relative prices. And you can see that these two sort of you know, either turn back or at least flatten off. Um, uh, as levels of income rise, so this is sort of the, the manufacturing curve. Um, what is happening is that 
this manufacturing curve has been shifting downwards uh, in all countries over time. Um, and here are um, what I'm showing is for, for employment. And this is a long term process. It's not something that has been happening, although it's been particularly striking since the 1990s. As you can see here, it's a continuous process. So here, um, look, I've divided the countries into two kinds of countries, manufacturers, importers, and manufacturers, exporters. So the countries on the right panel are countries that have strong competitive advantage in manufacturing. Those on the left are countries with uh, a competitive disadvantage in manufacturing. Uh, these uh, observations, the points with their sort of 95% confidence interval, is basically the estimated value that a dummy for that decade takes after you fit a curve for manufacturing employment shares uh, to a quadratic of GDP per capita and population levels. In other words, controlling for income and demographic determinants of expected employment shares in manufacturing. Decade after decade, there is fewer and fewer manufacturing workers uh, in countries around the world. That's a little bit less so in the manufacturing exporters, but even there you can see in the last couple of decades there's been a significant reduction. And these numbers are huge. I don't know if you can see it. Um, I think it's the volume. I think the number there is like almost 20 percentage points of the labor force. Very large reductions uh, in terms of, of, of expected or predicted employment. Okay, so this is just simply saying that over time, manufacturing jobs in uh, um, in, uh, in in in, employment in, in uh, across the world has been declining. Uh, the same is true for output as well. Uh, although you see the effect on output much less so as you would expect for the strong. Uh, manufacturing exporters. Okay. So it's the employment loss that is critical here, and that points to the fact that why a lot of the explanation is really the fact that uh, manufacturing has become much more skill intensive, capital intensive. You're producing much less labor, even if you're producing the same output, uh, you're, you're basically using much less labor. Um, <laughs> okay. So what does that mean? What that means now is that we are today <coughs> seeing patterns of structural change and structural transformation that are very, very different than what we're used to be seeing. So the traditional pattern of structural change is this, you know, the process of economic development. We have all our people first in traditional agriculture and informal economic activities, then the country industrializes, people move into you know, more uh, sort of manufacturing organized activities, and really the only difference across countries is how rapidly they do that. If you're a laggard, this is going to take a lot longer for you to do. But that's really the only way you're going to get rich. And eventually, of course, people move in the post-industrial economy <coughs> into the services. Right? This is the traditional pattern of structural change. What's happening today is this. It's not that people aren't leaving agriculture. People are leaving agriculture uh, very rapidly as well. Uh, but they're certainly not going into manufacturing. They're certainly not going, if they're going into manufacturing, they're not going into formal manufacturing. In the most cases, in fact, they're going directly into services. Okay? Um, into service kinds of activities. So that's, that's a, the implication of, of premature industrialization. Now, the problem with services is that uh, services really do not satisfy uh, the kind of requirements uh, that, that I've uh, identified uh, that makes manufacturing such a growth escalation or such a conveyor belt for rapid growth. In most developing countries, really, uh, it's a, there's a highly uh, dualistic nature of services. There's the high productivity tradable segments of services, uh, like finance, insurance, business services, IT services, and so forth. So these are very high productivity, they're part of the modern sector, and they probably exhibit some unconditional convergence. The trouble is that they cannot absorb the kind of labor that these economies have. Uh, they're highly skill intensive. Uh, then you have the very low productivity, the non-tradable services, and these services cannot act as growth goals, because even if you manage to trigger the process of productivity growth in some of these activities, they're necessarily their growth is limited by the domestic market. So even if you were to get your retail sector, get some you know, hyper markets to come in, your productivity of the retail sector goes up, that's, it can grow only so much, because if the productivity of the rest of the economy 
isn't increasing at the same time, then eventually uh, the productivity benefits are passed on to the rest of the economy in the form of, in the form of reduced prices, uh, and, and that, that um, shuts off the continued growth of, of, uh, of the service sector. Okay. Um, so that's the, that's the critical uh, issue uh, with respect to uh, services and why I don't think that they can actually substitute for uh, for, for uh, the absence of manufacture. Um, now let me turn finally to uh, the very last part uh, of, 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 of my talk and, um, and say a little bit about the recent growth experience. And I said at the outset that uh, my pessimism on growth prospects, or very high growth prospects of the European world is in some sense paradoxical because we've had a period of two decades uh, in a lot of countries of exceptionally rapid growth in the European uh, So um, how is that possible if I'm right? Uh, so here's, here's a list of, of countries um, that have uh, experienced some, some very rapid growth. So Ethiopia is one of my favorites, um, has been um, actually um, so it has been growing relatively rapidly since 2000. I'll show you something. India, uh, which began to grow much more rapidly, the growth acceleration sometimes earlier in the early 1980s, but actually its growth rate has continued to increase. Uh, so how, what do we make of these cases? Okay. Now, if Ethiopia, it turns out, that a large part of the um, increase in, in, in growth in Ethiopia is due to a very rapid ramp up in public investment uh, that so far seems to have increased productivity in the economy, especially in agriculture. Um, first of all, we can see that the Ethiopian case is not a manufacturing case. Uh, there's virtually no, no movement in the share of industry. The big change, as you can see here, is what has happened uh, in terms of investment. Uh, investment has actually increased from below 20% uh, to um, to almost um, uh, 40 percent, um, uh, which is very very rapidly. Um, so uh, uh, and, and it's like a, a, a very rapid growth rate of almost about 10 percent uh, per annum over the last decade, um, which is actually the actual the total investment rates. I don't know about the vertical axis there. The actual uh, investment rate is, is like a quadrupling of the investment rate from 5% to 19% of GDP, but this is just public investment. Um, if you turn to India, uh, in many ways the Indian case is actually uh, similar, although the role is played there much more by private than public investment until recently. Uh, once again, it is not a manufacturing case. We know that uh, India has not been particularly successful in exporting manufacturers. Um, uh, you, here you can see that the, the share of formal manufacturing employment between 1990 and 2010, just look at you know, the absolute numbers in terms of uh, millions. It's remarkable how stable it has been. So this is you know, very rapid growth in India and this period, and virtually no industrialization, especially in, the, in, in terms of the, the formal parts of manufacturing where convergence uh, is where we observe the convergence. Uh, where are the jobs coming from? Where the jobs are coming from uh, is actually people are leaving the farms. Uh, so you can see uh, people leaving the farms. Where are they going? They're going into construction, into services. They're not going into, into uh, manufacturing. So it, it's a kind of, of, of direct movement from agriculture uh, into, into services. Um, and here we see uh, what I mentioned before, a uh, rapid increase in, in uh, investment, particularly private investment, uh, in the case of India. So how, how do we make sense? How do we make sense of, uh, uh, of the experience of, of countries like, um, uh, well, before we do that, one other thing that I want to mention is, this might be needed. Um, actually, I'm going, to, I'm going to skip this because it's going to take too long uh, to, to explain. We go back to the national form. How, 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 do we, how do we explain, in terms of the framework, the kind of experience we're, we're seeing in recent high growth countries like, um, like um, uh, Ethiopia and India? Um, so, I, I think the basic story here uh, in these countries is something like the following that we're 
we're, we're seeing very much a, a demand kind of a demand led, investment demand led kind of a growth in these countries. So we have an increasing investment uh, that's having a direct effect on productivity um, and thus producing a sort of standard conditional convergence kind of a story of the type that I just mentioned. But actually, an increasing investment, whether it's public or private, has a secondary effect uh, in terms of what which is that you know, an increasing investment on the demand side is also generating higher incomes. And as people get more incomes, uh, their demand, in particular for services, is increasing. So there's an endogenous process of structural change that is kicked in, because as people now spend more of their money, not on traditional products, but on services, there's an induced structural change and workers are being pulled into those services. So there's an additional element of growth that comes to structural change, because many of those service sectors, on average, do have higher productivity. So we're having those two things, both the standard conditional convergence story, and then induced growth through structural change because of demand uh, um, that is due to this. Now, the reason that this is the kind of growth that is in some sense self-limiting uh, is because you're having this increased demand and employment in the service industries, while you're not having significant productivity boost in the services per se, or at least that's happening relatively, poorly, relatively slowly. So what you're having is lagging productivity growth in these expanding services. So unlike in the traditional industrialization growth, where you were having simultaneously expansion of manufacturing and employment, and rapid productivity growth in manufacturing, in countries like Ethiopia and India, you're having expansion of these service sectors, but a lagging productivity growth in those, in those sectors. Uh, and in fact, that is a, a general phenomenon, uh, that there is in general uh, a, a negative relationship. I think it's going to be actually easier to see this in the next slide. Um, if you look at the relationship between growth and employment and productivity growth across countries in services, what you're getting is a negative relationship. The more a service ex the more a service sector expands to absorb employment, the worse it does in terms of productivity growth. Okay? Um, so what that means is that this is not the kind of growth that can be continued, that can be sustained, because the sectors that are expanding are actually experiencing worse and worse productivity growth. Okay. That's, I ran through the last part a little bit too quickly, for which uh, I, I apologize, uh, but I want to talk about some of these recent cases as well. So let me basically um, end up, um, uh, and I think, uh, you know, uh, somewhat unhappily I provided, I think, an explanation for why manufacturing matters, but now why it's not going to matter in the future. Um, so uh, uh, that leaves me in a somewhat, in a somewhat uh, um, uh, um, awkward uh, situation. Um, it does leave me um, quite skeptical uh, that, that we can experience continued rapid growth on the part of some of these countries uh, that have had a, a miracle-like experience in the last uh, couple of decades or so. Um, but um, I'm open to sort of thinking about other models, and I think what we ought to be thinking right now is precisely uh, apply the kind of institutional imagination and policy innovation that, 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 that James Reed himself uh, uh, exhibited when he was talking about the problems of, of, uh, of, of Mauritius is trying to uh, apply the same kind of, of imagination and think about the next generation of low-income countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, think about what growth models might actually work for them in a substantial kind of way in a world where I think rapid industrialization and growth through industrialization seems to me uh, to uh, become less and less. Thank you.